The fourth installment in the series will be covering the evidence for evolution in the form of embryology and developmental biology. Now, studying the development of organisms is very, very important and provides us several distinct clues and predictions which can be made from the information gathered. As such, the observations that can be made from these disciplines also provide a p wonderful potential falsification method for evolution, which I'll dive into later. So to begin, as I stated previously, evolution contends that organisms will display traits during their development which are characteristic and present in their ancestors. For example, whales. Evolution currently contends that they evolved from legged mammals. When one examines the developing embryos of whales and dolphins, we find that they develop both arms and legs during development. Furthermore, these arms and legs are completely identical to those examined or to those exhibited rather by their tetrapod ancestors. For example, it's nearly impossible to differentiate a whale and a dolphin arm and leg bud from a human arm and leg bud. Further supporting this fact as evidence of common descent is the fact that they also express the same transcription factors, enzymes, and things like that in the same expression patterns which is also seen in their tetrapod ancestors such as us. Now make no mistake, of course like the bone morphogenic protein and the paxes, they're different as macrophages will eventually consume the arm and leg buds which is why the, the juvenile whales and dolphins don't have them. However, nonetheless, the expression pattern, the onset, the genes themselves are roughly the same. So if not for the fact that whales and dolphins share a legged ancestor, why would they have arms and legs during development? An argument could potentially be made that whales and dolphins are just an anomaly, and this is just a random freak thing, and it's not a universal truth behind the development of virtually every organism in the animal kingdom. However, as I'll show you, that's simply not the case. For example, many species of snakes, which of course evolved from legged ancestors, also show leg buds during their embryological development. Another powerful example of this can be seen in baleen whales. There are two types of whales, toothed whales and baleen whales. Toothed whales, of course, have teeth. Baleen whales, however, do not have teeth. Instead, they have a sieve which is used for capturing prey. However, evolution contends that baleen whales have toothed ancestors. Can you guess what we would expect when we take a look at developing baleen whales? Just as evolution predicts, baleen whales, all baleen whales, have full sets of teeth during their development. Now further supporting the idea that baleen whales have toothed ancestors and common descent is true is the fact that the earliest known baleen whale ancestor, Adiocetus, which was found in Oregon, has a full set of teeth. Clues regarding the platypus position in the phylogenetic tree can also be gained from embryological study as well. For example, reptiles and birds both lay eggs, and the emerging young use either an egg tooth to cut through the, the leathery egg shell or a specialized structure called a caruncle to crack their way out of the hard um, egg, and it's also found in turtles and birds. Now, mammals evolved from a reptile-like ancestor, and placental mammals, like humans and dogs, have lost the egg tooth and the caruncle because we don't have an eggshell to break through and there's simply no reason for it. However, monotremes such as platypi, or a platypus, are primitive mammals and they have both an egg tooth and a caruncle, even though the monotreme eggshell is thin and leathery. So it essentially has absolutely no reason for this. Why does it have it? Even more so, during marsupial development, an eggshell forms transiently and then is reabsorbed before live birth. So, although that they have absolutely no need to hack through the hard eggshell, there are several marsupial newborns, such as um, possums, koalas, bandicoots, they all retain vestigial caruncles as a clear indicator of their reptilian ancestor. Again, there's no other way to explain this than by common descent. This final example should hopefully tie a lot of things together for you guys. It's been known for quite a long time that two bones in the developing reptile eventually form into the quadrate and the articular bones in the hinge of the adult reptilian jaw. However, in mammals, those two bones develop not into structures related with the jaw at all. They develop into two bones of the middle ear, the hammer and the anvil. So essentially you have the same structure taking two completely different developmental and evolutionary paths. Now, from evolution and this information, we learned that the quadrate and the articular bones of the, the reptile develop into parts of the mammalian middle ear. But that's a wonderful idea, but how can we test it? One way is that we could take a look at the fossil record in transitional forms. You see, science is enormously self-critical of itself. So when we take a look at these fossils that are between reptiles and mammals, we need to find the bones that are of the reptilian jaw developing and transitioning into those of the middle ear that's found in mammals. And if we don't find those, then there's a problem. Fortunately for us, this problem is not an issue because we have specimens such as Thranaxodon. 
um, Thranaxodon, we can perfectly see the, the beginning of this relationship in the sense of the quadrate bone of Thranaxodon is beginning to articulate with that of the middle ear, and it's beginning to change the way that the organism hears. But that's, it doesn't stop there. There are many other features of Thranaxodon which completely link mammals to reptiles. For example, as most of you know, reptiles are cold-blooded and mammals are warm-blooded. So a, a transition would have to have happened in an animal such as Thranaxodon. Now, something very interesting is that we find Thranaxodon fossils in a, in a very odd physical position that we really never find reptiles in, and that's curled up in a ball. Why is that? Because there's only one reason to be curled up in a ball, and that's to be conserving body heat. Now, this is perfect evidence that Thranaxodon was actually warm-blooded, as opposed to reptilian ancestors, which were cold-blooded. Now, furthermore, many of these fossils have also been found in families with the adults and the juveniles together, and this is powerful evidence also that parents may have looked after their offspring, which is not seen in any reptile whatsoever. And, and this evidence, of course, is in, in conjunction with the fact that, you know, of all the homologous structures, um, the fossils in general, and the fact that we can see all of the other transitions and all the other diagnostic characteristics between reptiles and mammals evolving um, in Thranaxodon, among others. Now, in addition to this, as if all of this wasn't enough, we can make another prediction. Um, that because some of the bones, the, the quadrate, for example, of the reptilian jaws being moved into the mammalian ear, then the jaws of reptiles and mammals should be different as well. And as such, any kind of transitional fossils, again, between reptiles and mammals, should also show this jaw change happening. When we look at other specimens of a transitional fossil known as Cynognathus, we see exactly this. Cynognathus literally means dog jaw. So we can perfectly see the jaw transitioning from one that is related to or of reptilian origin to that of a mammalian jaw. So, and it's not only this also that characterizes it as a transitional species. In addition to all the other factors which I've mentioned before, um, it also has a secondary palate, which enabled it to breathe and swallow at the same time, another transitional characteristic. Furthermore, we're also beginning to see the differentiation of teeth. Um, as many of you know, reptiles don't have premolars and molars, which mammals do. Um, this transition is also present in Cynognathus in exactly the fashion that we would predict. And again, all of this started with embryology. Lastly, I'll touch on human development. Um, it's well known that humans throughout embryology develop tails, tails which are identical to all of our tetrapod ancestors. And again, the only way that we can possibly explain this is by common descent. Um, yes, uh, the tailbone does serve as an attachment for muscles. However, why develop a tail and misalign all of the spinal nerves only to have it resorb and shift everything completely out of whack and necessitate a cauda equina and things like that. It makes absolutely no sense, and the intelligent way to do it, if we were designed in present form, would be to simply have us develop the tailbone as is, and not resorb the tail and necessitate all sorts of macrophage activity and things like that. But I wanted to quickly touch on Ernst Haeckel, who, about the forged embryological drawings and whatnot, because any time that you bring up embryology, you cannot get away from this. Now the fact of the matter when you hear things like this is the fact that whatever Heckel forged, it, it, it did not serve as the basis or any kind of evidence or proof for evolution that we see today. Um, the embryos are as the embryos are, and because somebody forged something a century ago doesn't change a thing. Um, again, if it had served as perhaps the pillar of evolution and embryology and developmental biology and everything that we know today, then yes, it absolutely would change things. However, because it did not remotely do so, it's utterly irrelevant. It's a bit like saying, because Pastor Ted Haggard enjoys methamphetamine-fueled gay sex with a male prostitute, all of Christianity is false. Because Ted Haggard isn't the basis for Christianity, his gay sex affinity is absolutely irrelevant. So in conclusion, embryology and developmental biology provide powerful evidences in evolution as it allows us to go back in time and witness exactly how something evolved. Through embryology and developmental biology, we get to see all the stages that an organism went through on its evolution to its current form. So through the predictions made from life today, which are verified by the fossils, we can observe evolution unfolding via the fossil record.